My first night in Baghdad, seven months after Bush declared the end of the war. From where I was standing, that sounded a bit premature. According to the US government, though, I had nothing to fear. They were still claiming there was no such thing as a resistance, just a bunch of dead enders. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm glad none of the foreign press corps are here to see this. Just run into the bathroom. There's quite a lot of firing going on. You know, I say this every night on my syndicated sports talk radio show that the members of the United States military are the real heroes. Ladies and gentlemen, we got them. Ladies and gentlemen, we got them. We got them. We got them. Freedom Radio on 107.7 FM, Baghdad. How are you? How are you? It's more friendly here, less road rage. People very friendly. Yeah. Why is there so much traffic in Baghdad? Because uh, many streets close uh, the American. The Americans have closed the streets? Yeah. I went to Baghdad to find out if the resistance was a real threat were just the remnants of the former regime. In the months before my arrival, there had already been a wave of massive suicide attacks on major targets in Baghdad, and early signs of an armed Sunni resistance in the surrounding countryside. an American patrol on traffic duty. They're driving around the streets of Baghdad and with a tannoy telling people to drive on the right-hand side of the road to queue up properly at the petrol stations and not to buy black market petrol. But when I say traffic duty, this being Baghdad, someone just pulled out in front of them and they opened fire. <laughs> the war had been won thanks to careful planning, but seven months into the US occupation and Iraq's infrastructure was crumbling. Unfortunately, America's plans hadn't extended to winning the peace. This petrol queue stretches back hundreds of meters. And it's just by one of the central mosques here in Baghdad. The biggest danger in Baghdad is from getting run over, not from getting shot at. Are you waiting here for petrol? Yes, I'm waiting here. There is uh, no gas, no, no cholesterol, no oil because of electricity. Uh, there is no electricity. The continuing shortage of petrol in what was the world's second largest supplier of oil is perhaps the biggest testament to the failure of the coalition's reconstruction efforts. But it isn't just petrol that's scarce. There is a shortage of nearly all basic necessities. You're with Kim on Freedom Radio. And I just want to remind you that if you're riding around in any vehicles, make sure that you're wearing your seatbelt. Well, that's one way to beat the traffic. <laughs> USA! Huh? USA! Yeah? USA, good! You like no, it? Saddam! <laughs> USA, good! Freedom, USA! Thank you. Shukran. Yes, good. I was just driving to the Coalition Provisional Authority Centre and the road's been blocked. And they found a mortar device. Assalamu alaikum. Hello. Hello, how are you? Hello. Do they live around here? Yes. What's the situation like here? 
قبل كان امان هسه ماكو امان نهائيا حتى ما سووا شيء الامل كان اي شيء ما سووا حتى الاكل غلا على عينه كان اكو حرب وبس مع ذلك متوفر كل الامكان كان انت غازي 250 هسه ب 5000 كنا نقدر نطلع هسه احنا منو نريد نطلع 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 قومه ويانا شبابكم ويانا ليش انا مو امان ماكو امان well it's it's getting dark now so i'll let them go يقول لي اذا صار الظلمه يعني صار الظلمه يا فتى اذا تريد تروحون راح At 7 o'clock, we should just come back to our home. Yeah, okay. So, can you see that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Despite the problems, I had expected most Iraqis to welcome their new life of freedom. But then, what's the point of freedom if it's not even safe to walk the streets? There's not only a lack of basic necessities in Iraq, there's no effective rule of law, no accountability, and no democracy. I could understand the frustrations, but there was something far more sinister afoot, something I couldn't understand. The Imam was calling on Iraqis to rise up and kill the American occupiers, just a few blocks down the road from the headquarters of the American-led coalition authorities. Uh, sorry, I can take your film. British press. I'm reporting this Imam. What's wrong? Oh, sorry, I can take your film. Why? What are you what are you reporting? I'm making a documentary about the situation here in uh, Baghdad. Sorry, what's the problem? Sorry. Like a lot of Iraqis, the Imam seemed to think the American army and the Israeli army were one and the same thing. A month later, the Imam was in prison for inciting violent insurrection. Savage Garden, huh? Great band there. There they are with truly, madly, deeply. One of the big hits. Lenny Kravitz again. Jason Mraz in there too. Craig Roberts with the request line open right now at 800-595-7525. Apart from the sound of gunfire and the occasional bomb, people in Baghdad seem to be getting on with their lives. But outside Baghdad, I'd heard it was a different story. All coming up, so keep it right here. USA, radio sports. Today I'm heading out to Ramadi west of Baghdad, and the towns like Ramadi and Fallujah, in the so-called Sunni Triangle, west and north of Baghdad, where the resistance has been strongest. Just coming up to Abu Ghada prison, which was the biggest prison in Iraq under Saddam Hussein. But the Americans have now moved in, rather like they moved into Saddam's former palaces, and now in Saddam's former prisons. Like the rest of the world, it would be months before I was to know what was happening behind those walls. On the main highway leading west out of Baghdad, it felt like I was entering a different, much more dangerous world. Many Westerners chose to travel on this road in heavily armed convoys but I thought it was safer to keep a low profile. We're just arriving in Ramadi, but the road ahead's been closed by an American patrol. Have they closed the street? Yeah. The policeman just handed out a leaflet as we're driving into Ramadi and it's announcing a new curfew. What does it say? It said the curfew starts from 11, uh, from 11 evening till 4 morning. Who's it from? Who signed it? From the CPA. The CPA have the authority to shoot any people. It says that? Yeah. Where? This one. The CPA have the authority to shoot anyone. Thank you for your cooperation. The Americans already considered Ramadi a resistance stronghold. I was a little wary about getting out of the car, but even though I was mobbed, I was made to feel really welcome. It's very difficult to film on the streets. 
Not USA. But every time I set my camera up, I get mobbed. كانت الشعب العراقي كله يتمنى يقول لك احنا بس نخلص من نظام صدام والظلم اللي اللي عانيناه بهاي 35 سنه قلنا راح نشوف الديمقراطيه والانسان يحكي براحته ويطلع بكيفه ويحقق الشباب طموحاته كليته جو على بيوت داهمونا واخذوا اخذوا 14 واحد من عندنا شو الذنبهم هم؟ فلوس اخذوا ذهب ذهب اخذوا هي هاي الحريه اللي يحكي عليها بوش وين الحريه؟ العالم شباب عطالة بطالة لا شغل ولا عمل أنا طالب كلية المعارف لا شغل ولا عمل لا عمل يصعد ولا ينزل. It's like the whole street now. The whole street is stopping to tell me their grievances. تصرفات الأمريكية هنا إذا واحد يسوي شغلة يعني ما يشخصون عم حش يعني يعني واحد إذا سوى شيء لازم يضربون أكثر من مية <laughs> the anger and resentment in Ramadi was far more intense than anything I'd encountered in Baghdad. But I was also surprised by their willingness to share their frustration with an outsider like myself. I would have stayed longer, but I got a call that there was an attack taking place in a nearby town. Well, we're just filming on the streets of Ramadi. And then local journalists we were with told us they had a telephone call that an American Black Hawk helicopter has been shot down in the nearby town of Fallujah. I said that Fallujah was a helicopter. Yes, it was a helicopter. It was a helicopter. It was a helicopter. It was a helicopter. I think we're nearing the site now. Everyone in Fallujah, this town, has been pointing us in which direction to go, but now I can see two other American helicopters flying overhead. And I'm just laughing because I just saw two little children laughing and pointing, telling me which direction to go. It's a bizarre scene to enter a town where this is obviously the big excitement of the day. Are they, are they, do they think it's good news? If Baghdad felt like a city under occupation, out here in the fields surrounding Fallujah, it felt more like a war zone. What's happening? What's the bang? It's not sure if the Americans are coming under attack because there was two further explosions. على البيوت على السيارات على البشر الباجي قتل الباجين قطعوا النفط ما كل أزمة إحنا ما رد يهود بالعراق نفس الشيء اليهود ما رد يطلعون منا خارج هسه العالم هاي كلها مو من جماعة صدام حسين كلها يعني هسه هذا من ينزل على البيوت يسوي لهم واه الناس عندها خيرة هذا عربي ما يقبل هذا حكي أنا يا أخوي لا عنده سلاح لا عنده شيء طق عليهم لقم يبعد عنا 300 متر وهسه جهاله 
خوش يدعون يا ربي تهير امريكا يا زين هذا ذنب شنو؟ هل هذا ارهابي؟ وين اسلحته؟ ما قدموا الا دمار البلد دمروا البلد ياخذ من شو صار؟ انا ابني ايضا قبل شهر طلع على باب الله شرب الحي الصناعي عمره 17 سنه ان شاء الله يجي يوم يطلعون بالقنادر ان شاء الله ان شاء الله ان شاء الله ناخذ اثار اطفالنا ابنائنا شهداء راحوا يشانه راحوا هدر هيش الحال دمهم راحت هدر بعد The locals claimed they'd seen a helicopter shot down, but the official report claimed it was a crash landing. The US military had made similar denials before, which then turned out to be untrue. I was beginning to think the Americans were trying to cover up the real extent of the insurgency war. This is Steve West, Sports Talk host on the College Football Voice of the South Sports Radio 680, The Fan in Atlanta. Just want to say thanks to all of you for putting your lives on the line every day so that our freedoms can be preserved and the Iraqi people can taste them for the first time. I'm packed and I'm holding, I'm smiling, she lives and she goes and she lives for me. Said she lives for me, you've been who own motivation. She comes out and she goes down to me. And I'll make you smile like a drug for you. Do ever what you want to do, coming over you. All smile at what we go through One stop to the rhythm that divides you And I speak to you like the chorus to the verse Drop another line like a go to with the curse Coming like a freak show takes the stage We gave them the games to play to say The US authorities were telling the media everything was going according to plan But here in Ramadi, away from the briefings The 1st Infantry Division were confronted by open defiance and armed resistance well, ten years ago in Desert Storm, you know, they came out here and they knew who the enemy was. When we come out here, we drive through the city and we don't know who's gonna who's gonna open up on us or we don't know who's gonna blow us up, you know. So yeah. it really it really sucks for us because it's all. Can I ask you how you then? What do you think of the locals then? The locals, I don't know. I mean, I've grown I've grown to hate them. When I first got here, you know, it was all you know. We're driving through the desert and it's like, yeah, this is so cool, you know. We're in Iraq, but then. Then you kind of get complacent, is the word for it. You get complacent, you kind of like start, you know, oh, these guys aren't that bad, but then boom, you know, somebody blows you up and you're like, fuck, or excuse me. You're like, screw those guys, you know, you get all pissed off about it. And now, after four or five months of being out here, you can't trust them, so you gotta hate them, you know? Let's go! Move out! Let's go, guys! Is this all worth it? Mm, yes, I know. Because honestly, what I believe this country ain't gonna, they don't, most of these people don't want to be free. They so, it's, they've been running like this for so many generations. And it's, it's not gonna just work out right away. It's gonna take a, a long process of time right. for them to get used to being free or whatever. It's ultimately the people who are gonna decide whether or not they're gonna be free or whether they're gonna live in bondage to someone else. Right. Because. If they don't, you know, what happens if they want to? What happens if they start saying we want to be free of America? The people in Ramadi had told me all about how the Americans break down doors in the middle of the night. So I asked to go on a raid to see how they did things for myself. The night's mission was to apprehend one of the bad guys, and I was told to expect trouble. Am I getting out here? They had the name and address of the suspected insurgent, but as we walked off into the darkness, we immediately hit trouble. Who is firing? What's up? Sean, the reporter. Who's watching your back? Hey, tell them they need to get somebody up here to pull my rear. Because I can't pull rear security. Who the fuck are these people shooting? Hey, Ken. Sorry. Hey, man, watch the house through the fucking one o'clock. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
The platoon had spotted three men running in the dark, but they'd managed to get away. We entered the suspect's house, but he'd obviously heard us coming. Assalamu alaikum. Afan, I'm a Sahafi. It's the first time I've entered a home in Iraq without taking off my boots. Local tradition and custom bars men from entering women's bedrooms. But I could see these soldiers had a job to do. And with armed men on the loose, they had to take every precaution. Hey, hey. Hey, coming in. Coming in. One more shot, sir. One more shot, sir. Boom, boom, boom. One. Kristikov. You, Kristikov. Yes, one. She just said you have one. She just said one. Okay, fine. Roger, stay there. I'll get the air bit. These guys play like they don't understand. Keep Sean in the security. There's a gate over here, LT. Get on the base and cover the flank. Now watch that house over there on the left. They spread out and go up the hill. Watch out for guys on the far side. There were men out there with guns. But the soldiers protecting me had wandered off into the dark. For probably no more than about 30 bucks. Okay. 25 bucks. I, I buy, and that, and I that, buy and that, $135 hold up, hold up. shoes and that, too. And that serves the same purpose. No, I have expensive taste. That's why. And? That's okay. If okay. I get it, and your if, point is. If I your, get it, it's because it's expensive. Okay. I'm but, telling you. But the thing is, the thing is, I ain't you are. <laughs> I'm it all. You are. For no, real. I'm not either. Guys, are you talking about sneakers? Yes. And we're. <laughs> and we are here. <laughs> <laughs> Just something to pass the time along. Because uh, I heard a big argument. I was thinking, are, are these two professional, well-paid soldiers saying, is there a sniper to your left? Better check it. No, you're talking about sneakers. <laughs> <laughs> That's comforting. Are you the two protecting my rear? Yes. Roger. yes. Okay. Yes. Roger. Yes. We're going back to the base now, yeah? Roger. Just so you know, we found our guy's house. Yeah. But uh, he got tipped off. We got to go out and get our more information. We usually do that during the day. Right. And for the nighttime, we do stuff like this. Go out there, try and find him, stir okay. up some trouble or what, whatnot. We returned to base empty-handed and having lost a few more hearts and minds. It's a classic insurgency tactic to frustrate and attack the enemy and then turn on the people who then support the insurgents. Having been shot at by gunmen, I now wanted to hear what they had to say. I went back to Baghdad and spent the next few weeks trying to set up a meeting. And I was sitting in the back of a car in a back street somewhere in Baghdad, waiting for a man, a man who said he could help me find the resistance. And this is my third or fourth attempt. And every time I do it, I have a sleepless night. I wake up stressed out, drink lots of coffee, smoke cigarettes, and then spend hours sitting in the back of a car with an acid stomach because of all the stress. It's a really unpleasant experience. I waited all day, but no one showed up. 
Welcome to BBC World News, I'm Mike Hembley and we start with the news just coming in as we go on air. The US military in Iraq is saying it's killed 46 Iraqis and wounded at least 18 others as they attempted to ambush two US military convoys in the city of Samarra. A spokesman is saying that five US troops and a civilian were wounded by the attack. The killing of so many insurgents was being portrayed by the Americans as their biggest success to date. But there were conflicting accounts of what had actually taken place. So I decided to go to Samara to see for myself. Well, the Americans have got a checkpoint up ahead and they've pretty much cordoned off Samara. What's it been like this week? I mean, what's happening here? This week, the American forces have been hit by Samara and they have cut the roads that go into Samara. And this is the way that they go into Samara. They have to go for five hours. They have to go in. They've been searching people's houses. فتشوا داهم أول البيوت داهم أول البيوت وفلشوا قسم من البيوت وحجزوا وق كثير من المواطنين. Yes, they have searching many houses. Japan. British TV. Yes, my dear. Yeah. Hi guys. How you doing? Hi. There are quite a few journalists, though, in here, I think. I, th I think uh, if we can't make it work here, then we're in trouble. Look, look, look. Look, 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 look at that one. What's he doing? He said you have to come back. Oh. Come, come, come. This driver had turned back at the roadblock after the Iraqi police tried to search his boot. The atmosphere was incredibly tense, made worse by the presence of Iraqi police in hoods, warned for their own protection so that the locals couldn't recognize them. The name of this operation was IV Blizzard, and like previous operations, Iron Hammer and Bulldog Mammoth, and my own personal favorite, Ivy Cyclone Parts 1 and 2, it seemed the Americans had borrowed the name from some obscure heavy metal album. Their tactics, however, seemed to be borrowed from the Israeli Defense Force, a town sealed off, followed by house-to-house -house searches. The idea was to root out insurgents. What's been happening in this town this week? This <laughs> week, بعد اعتقال الرئيس السابق المقاومة يعني ما انتهت صارت عمليتين مجابهة ويا قوات الاحتلال بالمنطقة حرقوا لهم دبابتين بس وراها صارت عمليات مداهمة في كل سامر مشكلة يجي واحد يضرب له طلقتين بسيارة وراح وراها تجي لك هاي بدون عيار، اضرب هذا وجيب ذاك. بريتش تلفزيون. هاو از ات هير؟ رايت. ار يو ار يو سيرشينغ فور اني وان ان بارتيكولار؟ ار يو سيرشينغ فور اني وان ان بارتيكولار؟ ار يو it was bizarre, but the presence of the Americans didn't stop the locals airing their grievances right under the soldiers' noses. Yani 
This is really bizarre. There's an American patrol all around us crouching down. Some of the Americans are talking to people I've just been chatting to. This is quite a tense, bizarre situation. Yeah, not something we were trained for. Come on, come on. I mean, you're having we to learn. Trained for, but you know what I mean. Yeah. You're chatting to people, but there's trolling going on at the same time. It looks a bit difficult. Yeah, it's and I don't know whether I feel very relaxed standing here. It kind of gives you a false sense of security to be around all these people. It's not a very secure area at all. The claim that 46 insurgents had been killed turned out to be false. The American command was now claiming Operation Ivy Blizzard was a resounding success and would deliver a deadly blow to the resistance. But it also seemed to have successfully alienated the entire town. I went back to Fallujah, but this time on patrol with the 82nd Airborne, one of America's most battle-hardened divisions. They weren't really designed for winning hearts and minds. Fighting a counterinsurgency war takes political tact and military precision. Or you can do what the 82nd do and kick ass. Some months before, they'd inflamed local opinion by opening up on a demonstration in the town, killing 14 people. They had a bad reputation amongst the locals, but the feeling was mutual. As far as the 82nd were concerned, Fallujah was their enemy stronghold. They'd lost another helicopter the day before, and we're now expecting the worst. Do you feel like you're being watched all the time? Oh, of course. Of course. If there's a guy on the roof over there, standing up and sitting down, yeah. It makes you nervous. A lot of RPG attacks on convoys and stuff like that. You gotta keep your eye out. They Whoa, you got a flare. A green flare burst in the sky. It's the kind of signal used by insurgents before an attack. So those flares are warning signs? Some, yeah, but I don't think that one was. It's just what they were originally were, I believe. Right now they're more likely just trying to alert them to our presence in the area. They're just like, hey, we're here. You know, if you actually look at it, it's a historical fact. America has never gone to war with a country that hasn't McDonald's. That hasn't, that has a McDonald's. Think about it. See, it'd be, if they had a McDonald's, we would have to mess with them. Do you think in uh, Bosnia, Serbia, did they have McDonald's? Now they do. Now they do. Right. They got a McDonald's and a Taco Bell and a Pizza Hut in freaking Kuwait. Right. You know, it won't be, it won't be a matter of time before they get it up here. Well, it's a good thing we got Burger King in, in London. I love Burger King. <laughs> I actually prefer Burger King to McDonald's. I think well, it's I like better fries. But Burger King, hands down, VK Boiler, a, a chick, you know, a a Chicken Royale. It's all about the Whopper. Yeah. On this strip alone, you still have about four or five McDonald's restaurants. People will be happy. What they need here is a pizza hut. <laughs> it's hard to believe that this area here was once considered the uh, birthplace of civilization. Because you look at it now and it just doesn't at all seem that way. You'd think they'd have their... Whoa.
and now which I hadn't come on patrol. I can hear more fire. Heavy machine gun. There appeared to be just one casualty. He was an Iraqi policeman. A rocket propelled grenade had landed just a few feet from where he'd been standing. The new police force have borne the brunt of the insurgency war. They're targeted for collaborating with the Americans, who often place them on the front line when out on patrol. Fortunately, the injury didn't appear too serious. Do they get the guys firing? Or they... They haven't said anything. Right. Yes. And you think I was worried about dying of lung cancer? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank God they didn't aim over here, you know, because one of those RPGs could take this out easily. Oh, really? Some guy just told me I was safe. Yeah. Well, me. you're safe if you get behind that up armored Humvee. Ah, oh, OK. And that'll protect you. Right. But they'll, they'll take this out really? easily. They're pretty powerful. Don't take it personally, guys, but I'm going to stand over by that Humvee. <laughs> the attack didn't stop the 82nd from getting on with their counterinsurgency mission. A bulldozer was laying waste to the central barrier and tearing up the street, looking for IEDs, improvised explosive devices. The Americans had set up roadblocks either end of the main road and brought the town to a halt so the bulldozers could go in. The locals are going to be taking this the wrong way, aren't they? Yeah, I think they will be. We've been getting mortared about every other night out here for like the last week. And I think it's in retaliation for us taking all their weapons away. Right. I'm pretty sure it'll probably happen again tonight. Or yeah, now you're taking their barrier away? Yeah. Well, it's just a, it's an eyesore, period. And they keep sticking IEDs in here, so we're just going to take yeah. it away. They give it, we take it. Every time we've been attacked, it's been quick. It's right. hit and run. And right. then they take off. Yeah, they're chickens. They'll shoot at us, and they'll run away. Right. Now, every now and then, they'll have a couple that will stand ground. They're, they're just, those are the real hardcore extremists, the Fuja Hafadins. Right. How do they say it? Or the Fedayin. Yeah, the Fedayin guys and the bath party guys. Some of them will actually stay and fight, but most of the time it's just locals, you know, just getting their kicks off. Right. Just trying to, you know, slow us down from what we're doing. What are you trying to do? Trying to change these people's way of, I don't know. Just trying to help out a country that's been beat down for so long. And you always got your hard heads in the bunch. Right. And Felicia's one of them. All Ramadi's another. But eventually they'll they'll figure it out and say, hey, we're here to help and we're not we're not here to hurt. Right. You just heard uh, to expect another attack? Yes. It's the only bad thing about staying stationary and not moving for a long period of time is you're more susceptible to stuff like that. I've decided I don't really want to be on patrol with you guys. Can I, uh, <laughs> it's a little late to leave, isn't it? We settled down and waited for another attack. I could see how their tactics were losing hearts and minds, but I also now knew what it felt like to be a GI on the receiving end of hostile fire, and I viewed every local with suspicion. Demolish all the mosque persons. Yeah, it's a church, but that's where we always get shot at. Really? But if you get shot from a mosque, you can hit back, can't you? Return fire, if it's uh, return fire. It's kind of like one of those touchy subjects because it's like their religious temple. Or whatever. It's getting hurt. Under attack. Are they firing at here? They're firing up towards this is a little further this way. At us. Down 
like RPGs. Getting ready to leave. Oh, we've come under fire again. One of the Bradley fighting vehicles got hit. They said it's leaking fuel, so I guess they're going to go check it out. It had been a long day. The Americans had knocked down the barrier, and the insurgents had knocked out a Bradley tank. Mission accomplished. I thought now would be a good time to get out of town. They were the Bradleys protecting our rear, yeah? Yeah, those were two of them. The other two already left because the right. one had got hit. Yeah. yeah. So now would be a good time for us to leave. Yeah. So <laughs> Jackson spotted some wires popping out of there. Yeah. We were all set to go when someone spotted two wires protruding from the ground an IED which could be set off at any moment by remote control. I took cover behind a Humvee and waited for the Americans to blow the bomb. That stuff just landed behind me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very different experience being in Fallujah on patrol with the Americans. We've been here four or five hours. We've been told to leave at last. But I haven't really met any of the locals. And we've crossed the road there, but there's no communication. We're being looked at by through the end of a barrel. It was time to withdraw. A few months later, after the Americans launched a full-scale attack on Fallujah, killing more than 1,000 civilians, they pulled out altogether. Today, Fallujah is in the hands of the insurgents. Baghdad in some house, I'm not sure where. The curtains are drawn, and I'm waiting to meet a man from the resistance who's hopefully going to answer some of my questions. Because for nine months, there have been daily, almost daily attacks by the insurgents against American forces IEDs, RPG attacks on convoys, suicide bombs. Numerous helicopters have been downed, and now, nine months since the end of what Bush declared was the end of major combat, the end of the war, and even now, after the end, the capture of Saddam Hussein, the attacks continue. And yet this is a resistance without a name, a resistance without a voice. No one claims responsibility for any of the attacks. They don't talk to the media. And I don't know if it's a unique situation, but there's a full-scale guerrilla war going on in Baghdad and the surrounding areas west of Baghdad. This is the area commander of a local group, an ex-officer in the Republican Guard, made redundant when the Americans disbanded the Iraqi army. 
Another man stood guard at the door. Could he tell me why he joined the Makawama? And what are their aims? مقاومة الاحتلال الأمريكي لبلدنا احنا بلدنا احتل من السابق من قبل البريطانيين والآن يحتل من قبل الأمريكان احنا مقاومة ضد الاحتلال انت بريطاني اذا 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 شعبك اذا بلدك احتل وانت قاومت الاحتلال تسوي مشاكل لو تريد تطلع الاحتلال من من ارضك من بلدك احنا نريد نطلع الاحتلال من بلدنا احنا ما عبرنا المحيطات ورحنا لامريكا حتى نسوي مشاكل احنا داخل بلدنا فاحنا مقاومه من اجل ازاله الاحتلال المقاومه ليست ارهابيه يعني المقاومه مقاومه من اجل تحرير البلد امريكا جت تحرر العراقيين من صدام حسين الان صدام حسين راح ومسكوه وعدهم وليش ما يطلعون من البلد شكرا جزيلا ابليس الوقت انتهى بس كلمه اخيره اريد اقولها له لو خلت تعلم امريكا بانه احتلالها للعراق راح يلقنها درس قاسي اكثر من الدرس اللي احتلته واللي تلقته في فيتنام شكرا جزيلا شكرا جزيلا American losses were rising steadily, but the US authorities were still trying to downplay the extent of the insurgency, and it wasn't always possible to get the exact figures for the number of combat casualties. Most of the injured were brought here, to the 28th Combat Surgical Hospital Unit, part of a secured zone in the center of Baghdad. Can I ask what, what he's been brought in with? Oh, he had IED to his chest, um, which means he had a piece of shrapnel that uh, went through the left side of his chest. Right. Um, and he's got something in his neck too, so that means he needs to go to the operating room. The US government was trying to paper over the cracks by bringing their wounded back to America under the cover of darkness and banning media coverage of funerals. I've just been here, I mean, I arrived, and 10 minutes later, there's two helicopters landing. Is this what it's like every day? I mean, sort of... Uh, it goes up and down. The last couple of days have been a lot of uh, casualties coming through. A lot of injured, a lot of injured, but not being as reported on as much as the soldiers being killed. The public themselves, you know, saying, I don't want to get myself in trouble here, but I, I do believe a little bit of being misled. The wounded were accompanied by their platoon buddies who waited by their sides until the moment arrived when they could be taken back home. How long have you been out here for? What, in, in Iraq? In Iraq, since April 1. Since the beginning? Without a, a leave back home? Yeah, I went back <clears throat> to uh, bury my best friend. When a colonel and a Two other soldiers of ours got killed in a firefight. Um, I was selected to take them back. The leave you had was to take buddies back from here to be buried in the States. That was a way they could get me back to fulfill the wishes of him and his wife. Right. I was just going to ask uh, DJ, because you were out, you, you were at blast site, you were saying? Yes. Um, and do you remember what, what, what happened? Uh, just a white pickup coming the gate. As soon as it passed me, um, 
blew up. That's all I remember. Right. And what have the doctor said? You've got shrapnel. Yeah. They pulled some shrapnel out of my right leg. I've got some shrapnel and damage and uh, nerve damage to my left hand and arm. And right. And I got a hole through my uh, left ear and a gash in the back of my head. I bumped into a GI who'd been attacked near Samara. I've been trying to set up a meeting with the resistance there, so I asked the soldier what had happened to him. We were not quite to the Samara bypass, and a, uh, a vehicle come up by us and uh, started firing into our rear vehicle and then into the next vehicle, knocked us off the road, and there were people in the ditch waiting also, and we got caught in like a crossfire. And then uh, our hired security got us out of there, luckily, but we lost two people and had four people wounded. When, when, when was this? Uh, it was Christmas Eve afternoon. Right. Yeah. And you got shot, that's a bullet, Kalashnikov, that went what, yes. just by your... Right, right. Yes. Was it just a flesh wound or...? No, uh, actually, they, they pulled the bullet out. I've got it for a souvenir. <laughs> I just have an extremely hard head, fortunately. There was that Operation Ivy Blizzard in Samara, where they picked up a hundred people, right, right. and yet you got attacked just after that. Heck, after World War II, look how long there were things going on after every conflict for a good amount of time. Right. And this is no different. Do you feel this is after the conflict, or this is the conflict? Oh, that's hard to answer. I don't really have an answer for it. Right. hearing on the radio another helicopter coming in with new patients. Okay. That's another another lock coming in now, yeah, the helicopter. Yeah, gunshot wound to the head. Gunshot wound to the head? Yeah. Okay. I've been out here for almost five months now, so it's been a very big eye opener. Uh, back of the states, I didn't hear, you know, heard of patients dying, but you didn't hear about the casualties. So the casualties are actually a big eye opener. Right. So, What's it like? I mean, are you working here? It's very yeah. stressful. It's hard, sad, especially okay. when you got these people that have lost limbs or, you know, are trying to get them back to their families and, you know, just the thought of what their families are going through, waiting for their yeah. family member to return, that's, that's kind of a burden on you. But the fact that we get them home, that's the nice thing about it. I wasn't expecting this to be so traumatic. I've been in the hospital all day now, and those helicopters have been landing every few hours. It's very easy to read in the newspapers and watch TV about Americans doing this and doing that, and American policy and the American president. It's when you meet a person face to face who's been injured and who's suffering. And it's shocking. And the things people are saying to me away from the camera are even more shocking. But it's really that, that this is... What you read in the newspapers doesn't really do justice to what's happening here. staff on the air. Now boys, I want you all to have a good time, but I don't want anybody getting hurt. I want to collect the guns. Freedom Radio. A resistance group in Samara had agreed to meet. I drove to the outskirts of the town, where I was met by some men in switched cars. They drove me through the back streets, avoiding American patrols. I was a bit worried that I could be attacked at any moment, 
either by the Americans or these men themselves. The men assured me I was in safe hands. When they introduced me to their commander, I was surprised to learn that not only had he led the attack on the US convoy on Christmas Eve, he also claimed to have actually fired the shot through the window of the vehicle belonging to the GI I'd met in the hospital, who'd been shot in the head. Can you tell me about Christmas Eve, when they attacked uh, the three SUVs, the, the sports utility vehicle, the Jeeps? Yeah. Because I met okay. one of the Americans who was attacked, who was shot in the head. <coughs> what, what happened? هو كانت يعني من خلال الاستطلاع اتضح انه اكو مجموعه من القاده ومن عناصر المخابرات مدعوين للحفل ببغداد فتم نصب كمين لهم بعبوات ناسفه والحمد لله تمكن يعني من الحاقه الاذى بهم وقتل ثمانيه من اشخاصهم احنا انضمينا للمقاومه بعد سقوط بغداد مباشرة لأنه اكتشفنا الزيف الأمريكي أمريكا جابت ناس وياها مدربة على خراب البلد فأول ما بدأت خربوا البلد فكيف أنت تأمن شخص أو تأمن دولة هي أصلا جت الخرابك فعرفنا أنه نية أمريكا مع العراقيين هي غير سليمة Do the resistance have any American prisoners of war? أكو أسرة أمريكا Yes, yeah. الحين ما اذا ما اعلنت امريكا عن الاسرى ان ان المقاومه لها تصرف معهم سواء يكون المقايضه باسرى او قتلهم او اخراجهم على الشاشه لفضح الاداره الامريكيه بس هو راح يكون بالنتيجه راي وقرار يخدم المقاومه مو مثل ما تعمل امريكا بكل تصرفاتها تصرفاتها تخدم الحمله الانتخابيه The next week, a bomb went off in Samara. I knew the resistance commander I'd met was also a bomb maker, and I wondered if this was his handiwork. Both myself and my driver were now feeling the stress. Well, Sam and my driver <coughs> is a fan of Julio Inglesi. Is it Julio? Julio Inglesi? Iglesias. It's Iglesias. Yeah. Julio. Which I'm not sure if that makes me more relaxed or less. <coughs> yeah, it makes you relaxed? Yeah. Good. To relax. From American agency. There's a tank Station. pointing uh, right at us. Samara was sealed off again, and we had to ask special permission to enter the town. Again, we let the press drive in. No, no one. There's no vehicles allowed past okay. this point except for the Iraqi police okay. and uh, ICDC. Oh, you need to wait to tap the app. If you guys want to, though, you can walk in. Yeah, you can walk. Operation Ivy Blizzard had been hailed as a resounding success by the US forces but I now knew the operation had failed to deter the resistance. I'd already met the resistance leader in town, and now a suicide bomber had detonated a car bomb, narrowly missing a nearby American patrol. All the victims were Iraqis. I don't, I don't know what kind of bomb, but there's one, two, three, four, seven cars completely destroyed. The car was here. Wow. <coughs> Is that the car? This car is charged car. That's the suicide. Yeah, yeah, suicide. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. جريح واربع شهداء من ضمنهم ضابط شرطه وشرطه ثلاثه صارت هاي 
هاي سيارتي احترقت سيارتي ذيك الاخ هم تاذت بس هاي بس هاي هاي مالتها هاي مالتها لا هاي هاي هذا ماكو القعد بالصدر يسوق نحوس ما توفى بس القعد بصفه من هناك ما مات يعني شظيه شظيه شنو ملاحته اي سي دي سي نو اي سي دي سي مواطن عادي مواطن عادي مواطن عادي مواطن عادي واقف خطيه يعني هذا شنو ذنبه؟ والله من خارج سامرة من داخل سامرة من من ال قبائل يعني شلون نقول؟ هنا ماكو الا شديدنا ملابسه عليه ترى قدرنا نطلعه ملابسه رجليه مقطوعه بطنه ماكو وقع مصارينا بالقاع يعني مقطع يعني كلها عمار عمار كيف صحة شكرا standing in the blood of the man who died in this car and there's actually blood all around me in the mud and I've been spending months trying to make contact with the people who are responsible for this kind of thing and I've talked to some of the people even here in Samara and this is very difficult to stomach when you see the, the effects, it makes it very difficult to sympathize. A young American lieutenant was in charge at the scene, but she wasn't able to communicate properly with the Iraqi Civil Defense Corps under her command. Do you need anything? Yeah. This is my translator, sorry. Okay. If you can ask them, I would like his group of ICDC to stay. Here? Yes, and tell him, until the other group of American gets here, if they can stay along the sidewalk. Okay, tell them to keep all people away from it. They can take pictures, but no one should be touching. 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 Right. Tama, who, who are you working for, me or the American Army? Sorry. Oh, the one who... Because not tell me. Yeah, very tell excited. My, I've just because... lost my translator. <laughs> he fancies the American soldier. Oh, were you here when it happened? Yes. Wow. Knocked me right off my feet. Really? How's your hearing? Because I know that's... Uh, here's a ring. My parents will probably tell you I listen to too much rock music before anyway. <laughs> Where are you from? I'm from Florida. Florida. I mean, apart from this morning, have you come under attack? Yes. Quite often? Yes. The uh, My platoon especially is just bad luck or whatever, but we got uh, mortared when we lived in that building, had six casualties. We had uh, RPG attacks, small arms attacks, probably five IEDs that have hit, directly hit vehicles. These soldiers had been given a week's training by the Americans, but after the official handover, they're now expected to take on the resistance. Thanks a lot, Lieutenant. No problem. Good luck. Good luck. Stay safe. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your help translating. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. This is bizarre, standing in blood, surrounded by devastation and yet laughter and flirtation. A few months later, part of the local defense corps went over to the side of the insurgents. And like Fallujah, Samara is now in the hands of the resistance. Back in Baghdad, the security situation had deteriorated and the number of attacks on US forces had increased. Damaged buildings were being cleared, but there were no other signs of the much vaunted reconstruction effort the coalition governments had promised. Everything from sewage pipes to electricity plants had broken down. The only building work being done was for security measures. 
Baghdad was disappearing behind bunkers, concrete walls and fences. Some workers back there erecting a fence. And these fences have been going up all over Baghdad, over bridges, to stop attacks on patrols below. And here was something else you see a lot of in Baghdad, a dead body being taken to the morgue. This coffin belonged to an Iraqi policeman killed in his car, run over by an American tank. Quarter to six, um, and an hour ago, some contacts of mine had a meeting with someone I met. Oh. I was about to say I was waiting, waiting on to hear back from someone in the resistance. So hopefully this is it. Hello. Uh, hello. Good. The meeting was set up with the resistance in Ramadi, but in the three months since my last visit, the mood of the town had become a lot more militant. We just bumped into a demonstration against the Americans on the streets of Ramadi. I'm actually supposed to be meeting someone in the resistance. But I tell you that now, I'm in a crowd. <laughs> it's all going on in Ramadi. And it is now taking on more of an open resistance against the Americans. بأنه المقاومة تابعة إن إحنا أنا أنا أعتبر نفسي إرهابي. الأخ هنا إرهابي الكل إرهابيين <تصفيق> إذا تصفهم الولايات <تصفيق> المتحدة المقاوم بالإرهابيين فمدينة الرماد الكل إرهابيين <تصفيق> A man in the crowd came forward he was holding a grenade إحنا ما نقبل الأمريكان يطبون أرضنا إحنا مسلمين مجاهدين إحنا إحنا ما نخليهم إن شاء الله نظل مجاهدين يقتلون الأطفال والنساء I wasn't sure if he was going to pull the pin, but I didn't really want to wait to find out. I decided to call it a day. Okay. Come on with me. Come on with me. But as I walked off, the crowd began to follow me. A few of them started kicking me and throwing things. The crowd was beginning to morph into a mob. 
so someone grabbed me and pulled me into a shop for my own safety. In the shop. But what problem? Okay. Mr. Sherman, sit down in the Sherman, Mr. Sherman. Sit down in the Sherman. I'm a Sahafi. Mr. Sherman, please sit down in the Sherman. Sit down here, sit down here, sit down here. I'm okay. I'm okay. Sit in the bar, sit in the bar, sit in the bar. Yeah, yeah. Five minutes. No, no, well, let's go in the car. Sit down, sit down. Sit down, five minutes, Mr. Sherman. Okay, okay. Sit down five minutes, Mr. Shaw. Okay. Mr. Shaw, sit down five minutes. Let's come. Good. Wow, yeah? The mobs turned on me. They were demonstrating. Now they've turned on me. And then there's a guy with knives and grenades. And I'm now waiting here. The mob is outside. Why are they against me? Five minutes, Mr. Shaw. Mr. Shaw, sit down. Right. Five minutes, you see? Okay, sit down. let's come, let's come. One of the men pulled out a gun and told me to follow him. Another armed man walked behind me. No, 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 come, come. It's okay, it's a, come and it's come and the men cleared a path through the crowd and walked me to my car. Later, it struck me as somewhat ironic. My life may have been saved by members of the resistance. Let's go, let's go. Quickly. Wow, they had grenades. And suddenly the mob turned on me. But half of them did, and half of them were helping me. But it all went a bit pear shaped when a guy pulled out a grenade and then was trying to take the pin out in front of me and talking about Islam. What, what was he doing with the grenade? <laughs> yeah, took a grenade. And then I. Well, the bizarre thing is the men who got me out of there, I'd interviewed before, and they were saying hello to me. But one of them, anyway, there was people pulling out guns, there were people with grenades, and I wasn't sure who was going to protect me. But I was getting kicked a bit. I said that anger and the resentment in Ramadi is spilling out onto the streets now. In the three months since my first visit to Ramadi, the streets had turned from resentment into open resistance. The American occupation there had a popular uprising on their hands. But a new, more sinister threat has emerged. My meeting with the resistance has been set up in a house somewhere outside Ramadi. This group, although Iraqi, had no ties or loyalty to the old Saddam regime. They owed their allegiance to the resurgent strain of militant Islam now spreading across Iraq. The American occupation, somewhat ironically, has turned the once secular state into a country where religion now defines the debate. Allah, 
ونسقي بدمائنا أرض هذه الوطن العزيزة التي تربينا عليها بلد الأنبياء والأولياء الصالحين The Americans aren't only faced by homegrown Islamic insurgents. I passed this bridge every day and made friends with the platoon manning it below. We didn't know it at the time, but a number of them were going to die at the hands of foreign militants. Sean. What's your name? Adi. What are you doing here? Eric. Eric, nice to meet you guys. Kenny. Kenny? Yes. Nice to meet you. Lopez. Lopez, nice to meet you. Rudy. 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 How long have we been under the bridge this time? Oh, this, this... Just, just rotation. Day? Yeah. Oh, just a day. Just a day. Yes, yesterday at four in the afternoon. Right. Got here. So nothing, nothing's happened since then. And this is where you sleep. You sleep under the bridge. Kind of like a homeless person. Yeah. <laughs> Reminds you of the Titanic. I'm, I'm not giving you any money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering what it's like, the daily, you know, in a, you know putting up with this every day. You just handle it with stride. You know, every day is a new day. You just keep going, you know. You talk about family, talk about things that you used to do back home. And uh, just pretty much just take it with a grain of salt. A week after my visit, a suicide bomber drove a lorry full of explosives under the bridge. The bomber belonged to the terrorist group led by the Jordanian al Zakawi, an Al-Qaeda operative and America's most wanted man in Iraq. The man responsible for beheading an American contractor on video and who claimed responsibility for the attack on the UN building in Baghdad. His group filmed the attack. If you look across, it's like you, you hear all the, you know, chanting at night or the praying, and it kind of sounds like that movie, you know, uh, Black Hawk it? Down? Yes, with the Rangers and... What other movies have you seen? War movies. Oh man, I've seen a lot. Yeah. Platoon. Uh, Platoon. I've seen them all. Um, Apocalypse Now. Apocalypse Now. That was a good one. With, uh, one Nine Art. <laughs> is that is that military re required military reading? <laughs> yeah, it is. Passes the time. <laughs> I know it's none of you've mentioned Rambo. Rambo. That's a, <laughs> we saved the best for last. That's what right. we was waiting. I was about to get to that, but you just jumped. Right. Well, it's okay. A week after the attack, I returned to the bridge one last time and said my goodbyes to the platoon. You've seen enough of this bridge to last a lifetime? Right. A lot of difficult times. Pretty bad. Yeah. Was the last, that last week, was that presumably one of the harder ones? Which one? Carbon? Carbon. Well, that was the two of my friends and shit, really close friends. I don't really like talking about no, it either. Don't you don't have to, you don't, don't talk about anything you don't want to. Yeah. It means more to us because we actually know the people. When it really hits hard here, we actually see them every day. We'll get home eventually, but... I don't know how soon.
Americans and British were told by their own intelligence services that the invasion of Iraq would spread terrorism and not contain it. Contrary to the claims of Bush and Blair, Saddam had no real links with Al-Qaeda. But as a consequence of the occupation, Iraq is now the new front line in the war on terrorism. Most of the victims are innocent Iraqis. On my last day, I decided to stop outside Abu Ghraib. Like the bridge, I'd passed it almost every day and seen the queues of people waiting outside grow. I'm just coming up to the edge of Abu Ghraib prison, and every day I see the queues grow longer. The Americans have detained more people. They estimate that there's something like 10,000 Iraqis are being held. A woman approached me and asked if she could talk, but she was too scared to show herself to the camera. She worked as a translator in the prison. <laughs> Some of those waiting had been handed tickets and the guards were now calling out numbers to allow the lucky few to visit their relatives held inside. Hi. Did you ask for this? Uh, First, you never ask. Second, you are not allowed 
to have this location. Excuse me, sir, press credentials, please. I've asked, yeah, I'll show you them, sorry. London? Okay, sir. You cannot be here, okay, and filming without our permission. Okay. Forward position, forward position. This is Sergeant Perry, over. <laughs> I'd been told to stop filming and ordered to leave by the Americans. But at the perimeter fence, I was introduced to a man who was desperate to talk. Could you tell me about the conditions? What's this? Bullets. They, they, hit, they hit them, they shoot them with these bullets inside the prison. Plastic bullets. the relatives already knew what was happening to their loved ones inside. They were being tortured and raped in the name of freedom, a fact that would later shock the world and did more than anything to turn the Iraqis against the occupation. Bush may have declared victory back in 2003, but I couldn't help feeling that the real war had only just begun. AP Network News, I'm Ed Donahue. President Bush says he will order an investigation into intelligence failures in Iraq. The president defended his decision to go to war in Iraq based on intelligence that Kay now says was erroneous. Kay says Iraq did not have weapons of mass destruction. And now a word from retired Master Sergeant Grumpy. <laughs> Kids today, they got it easy. Well, when I was in Iraq, we used to get shaken all night long. <laughs> we didn't have no fallout shelters. We didn't have no sandbag trailers. All we had was a steel pots and our butts to kiss goodbye. And we sure as heck didn't have no freedom radio. 107.7 Baghdad.